We supplicate for ourselves and we supplicate for the deceased. And of course, all of these ibadat or acts of worship, we are the number one beneficiary. Because mentioned in the hadith that whoever follows the janazah, right, and prays on it, right, they would have the reward of the size of the mountain of Wahid. And whoever follows it to the cemetery and participates in the, in, in the, in the burial, then he has another you know, Mount of Wahid worth of rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In it, there's also an act of righteousness towards the deceased, is that you're following the janazah, and it's a testimony that this has been a righteous person. Uh, in the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, whoever prayed upon by 100 believers, they become shafi' intercessors for him in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In one other hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said 40. 40 people who pray upon the deceased are eligible to become intercessors, you know, on behalf of this disease in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, so it, the Muslim ummah is one unit, is one unit. Be it you're living or you're dead. Even your dua, when you make your dua, you're making it for yourself, you're making it for the rest of the ummah that is alive, and you're making it for the rest of the Muslims, from Adam alayhi salam all the way to the last person who's going to live on the face of the earth. That is a dua that death does not put between us. This is the relationship of a Muslim to a Muslim, a believer to a believer. And be it the followers of Adam السلام, or the followers of Nuh, or the followers of Musa, or Isa, or Muhammad, or any other prophet, peace be unto them all, they are all believers. We are all brothers and sisters in the Mimla, and that is the most important relationship in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As he says, Inna akramakum indallahi atqaakum. Those who are most honorable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala among you are those who are believers, those who are pious and righteous. Nobody else. No color, no gender, no height, no weight, no, no, no social status, no, no education, degrees, whatever the case may be, that's not important, that is not a consideration in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's the only one who is going to decree our fate on Judgment Day, so that is the only one that his decree really matters, and his criteria really matters. So now we prayed upon the deceased, we carried upon the soldiers, we buried the deceased, and now people gather around the grave. They don't face the grave, but they rather face the Qibla. And I emphasize on these issues, why? To move away from innovations and bid'ah that have been introduced into the deen, and to practice the sunnah as the Prophet ﷺ taught us how to practice it. Because now, when we go to the graves, we see so many bid'ah, we see so many innovations, be it people who circle around the grave or people who ask the deceased to, you know, to, 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 to grant them rizq, or to grant them sustenance, or to grant them children, or to grant them health, or any of that. Just a lot of nonsense, a lot of acts of associating in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala another deity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised not to forgive. So, so I emphasize on this, is that do not face the grave, but rather put your back towards the grave, and face the qibla and then supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as at that moment, after the burial is done, who comes to the grave? Munkar wa Nakir. Munkar wa Nakir. We are the two angels that come to the deceased in their grave, and then they come to him from the direction of the head. And then the Salah would stand as a bodyguard. And they will say, not from here. Not from here. They would come to him from the direction of the right hand side. And the Siyam would stand and say, No, not from here. And they would come to him from the left side. And the Zakat would stand and would say, No, not from here. They would go to him from the direction of the feet. And the rest of the righteous deeds would stand up like your Sadaqah. Uh, enjoying blood relationships. Enjoying the good and forbidding the evil. Uh, your Hajj, your Umrah, your pilgrimage, your Umrah. All of the righteous deeds, all of the other will stand and say, no, not from here. So now, this is an excellent sign that you are going to pass that test. And you're going to pass these three questions. And the ayah that we mentioned, يُثَبِّتُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِالْقَوْلِ الثَّابِتِ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ Now you're on the Akhirah. This is your judgment day. This is my judgment day when I go six foot under. Okay? So Munkar wa Nakir will sit at a distance from the deceased. And they will ask him these three questions. Man huwa rabbuk, wa ma huwa deenuk, wa ma taqoolu fi al-rajul alladhi bu'itha feek. Who is your Lord? What is your deen? What's your religion? 
And what do you say in the man, and his name is not mentioned, the name of the Prophet is not mentioned. What do you say in the man that was sent for you? The believer will say, Allah Rabbi, wa Islamu Deeni, wa Muhammadun, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Rasuli. And the angel will say, Dhananna an taqula hadha. We thought that you would say this. We thought that you would say this. So those who are standing out making dua, making supplications for the deceased, they are making supplications just like the Prophet Sallallahu uh, commanded those who witnessed you know, the funerals, he said, Salu al-thabat al Ask for steadfastness, steadfastness for your brother. He is now being asked. He is now being asked. So the fitna of al-qabr, each and every one of us, the tribulation of the grave, each and every one of us will undergo. So when these angels say, we thought that you would say this, but they are commanded to ask no, no matter what. That's, that's their mission, that's their duty, that's their job description, if you will. Okay? So you stand there, you make supplications for them, you receive the condolences. Now, what we say as the best of condolences to give to someone, إِنَّ لِلَّهِ مَا أَخَذْ وَلَهُ مَا أَعْطَى وَكُلُّ شَيْءٍ عِنْدَهُ بِأَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what he has taken, means this deceased, be it a son, a father, a family member, a loved one, a friend, to him what he has taken already, because it belongs to him. وَلَهُ مَا أَعْطَى In the first place it was his, because he's the one who has given it to you. وَكُلُّ شَيْءٍ عِنْدَهُ بِأَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى Everything is according to a prescribed period of time. In a prescribed time, in a prescribed place. فَلْتَصْبِرْ وَلْتَحْتَسِبْ So now we command the family of the deceased to what? To have sabr, patience. To have ihtisab. Ihtisab means that to look forward for the reward for the loss of, you know, this loved one. Okay? And we also mentioned the statements uh, that the Prophet ﷺ has taught Ummu Salama when her husband passed away, when she said, Allahumma khlufli fi musibati. Allahumma ajirni fi musibati wa khlufli khayran minha. O oh Allah, reward me for my loss and replace it with that which is better. Whoever says this upon deep convictions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him tremendous rewards and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace him with that which is better. Umm Salama ended up marrying the best, not just that which is better. She ended up marrying the Prophet himself. That is better, definitely, than Abu Salama. He was a very righteous man, but the Prophet is the number one man. There's the, he's second to none. Okay? So, so فَلْتَصْبِرْ وَلْتَحْتَسِبْ Meaning that look forward, you know, have patience, and look forward for the ajib, for the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the condolences that we give, again, you know, to, to basically to, you know, help the family cope with the calamity and the loss, you know, that they have done. Now, certain innovations also have been introduced, and subhanAllah, uh, some scholars say that whenever a sunnah disappears, a bid'ah replaces it. It's inevitable that whenever a sunnah, a practice of the Prophet ﷺ disappears, is replaced by a bid'ah. So some of the bid'ah that we see is that people will come to the masjid, divide the Qur'an into 30, diff into 30 different parts, and everyone sits around and starts reciting the Qur'an, start reading the Qur'an. That is a bid'ah. That is a huge no-no. Something else that we notice also that it's the family of the deceased that prepare the food for everybody else who came to give their condolences. And that is a huge mistake. Because the Prophet ﷺ said that it is the neighbors or the extended family or you know the, the rest of the Muslims, the community, that prepare food for the family of the deceased. Because now they are busy with the burial with the arrangements, they are saddened, they're not, their mind is not on food and water and so on and so forth. So we, are, we, are, we have reversed the sunnah, and that is of course a huge norm. Of course there are many other bid'ah, like we see for example women following the janazah. You know, this is a no-no. Women, in fact, because of their emotional nature, they ought to stay behind. And not only they follow the janazah, they go to the graveyard and they mingle with the men. And oftentimes they're not wearing the proper attire. Meaning that the proper Islamic attire that a woman ought to, you know, wear. Oftentimes they'll be wearing makeup and perfume and things of that nature. And that of course, the more bid'ah there is on the grave, the less likely these supplications will be accepted. The more bid'ah on the grave, the less likely the supplications will be accepted. 
So what we can do for the deceased is to basically, first and foremost, practice the sunnah every step of the way. Number two, to make dua, supplications for the deceased, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives their sins. Number three, we can recite the Qur'an, just like I would sit and just recite the Qur'an and then I would say, oh Allah, please give this reward, right, for the deceased, for my mother, for my father, for my loved one, for her. So, so that's another. Thirdly, what's mentioned in the hadith, إِذَا مَاتَ الْعَبْدِ إِنْ قَطَعَ عَمَلُهُ إِلَّا مِنْ ثَلَاثِ When the Abd, the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, dies, his deeds from this dunya are severed, except from three. Huh? عِلْمٌ نَافِعْ means that knowledge that they've left behind that people are benefited from. Could be a book, could be a CD, could be uh, whatever the case might be. People that he had taught. Uh, Quran classes that he has given to the youngsters. Memorization classes, whatever the case may be. That stays behind, continuing to reap the reward for the deceased. وَصَلَقَةٌ جَارِيَةٌ صَلَقَةٌ جَارِيَةٌ is money that one invested perhaps in an orphanage home or in a masjid or in a, in a Sharia school, you know, a religious school, or any other, even digging up a well. And this is something not to be underestimated, digging up a well, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything, or every living thing from water. And, you know, there are many places on the face of the earth where water is extremely scarce, okay? So, so this Salat Ajari that continues to reap its rewards even after the person perishes, وَوَلَدٌ صَالِحٌ يَدْعُوا لَهُ And a righteous son or daughter that continue to supplicate for the deceased after they passed away. And we also mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commissions an angel to come with this gift, with this reward. After the deceased has been shown their place and their rank in paradise, they continue to elevate in these ranks and they would say, well, Allah, where does that come from? You know, I thought my status has been set and my level has been established. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send them this angel and say, this is from your righteous son. This is from your sadaqa jariya. This is from the knowledge that you've left behind. So, so these are investments that you can make that will continue to reap its dividends after you've passed away. So some of the things that we can do perhaps is perform the umrah on behalf of the deceased. If they have debt, to immediately pay the debt. Because even the martyr is held in, in, in captivity, if you will, in prison inside their grave if they perish and they leave debt behind. Okay, so, so debt has to be paid, no ifs and no buts. Debt of the deceased has to be paid and the sooner it's paid, even it's better. The ideal situation is to, you know, repay this debt before the person is buried. Because everyone will be held hostage in their grave until their debts are paid. So this is the responsibility of the immediate family and then the circle expands until the debt is covered. So we said recitation of the Qur'an, uh, if the person has vowed to do something and they perish before they've done it, it's, obligation, it's an obligation now upon the family to fulfill this vow, okay? And to, of course, visit the grave. And we come to another stage here, which is, and we'll conclude with that, inshallah, which the statements of the Prophet Sallallahu when he says, كُنْتُ قَدْ نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْ زِيَارَةِ الْقُبُورِ أَلَا فَزُورُهَا At the outset of the message, when you are so closely connected to the practices of the days of ignorance, prior to the coming of Islam, where people would go to the grave and they would, you know, cut their clothes and they would shave their hair and they would wail and they would scream. And so all of these practices were vivid in the minds of the Sahaba when they embraced Islam. So the Prophet Sallallahu prohibited them from visiting the graves in the first few years of the da'wah. When the aqidah has rested in their hearts and they receive the training that the Prophet ﷺ has given them and the education that is divine, the Prophet ﷺ says, I initially prohibited you from visiting the graves. Now you can visit it. What is the wisdom behind that? It reminds you of what? Of death and die, which is an inevitable ending of every person. So what are the etiquettes when we go visit the grave? Number one, it's preferable that you go in a state of wudu. So you go there in a state of wudu, and many of the scholars said it is okay for a woman to go visit, because, you know, of course it's an issue of disagreement upon, you know, among the scholars, but many of the scholars said it's perfectly okay for women to visit the graves so long that they observe the proper etiquettes of visiting the graves. No wailing, no screaming, 
no uh, uh, you know improper attires, no makeup, no perfumes, none of that. They go in a state that is very representative of what a righteous Muslim woman ought to look like. She goes with the muhram, meaning that she would go with her son that reached uh, an age of puberty, would go with her brother, would go with her uncle. She would not go by herself because oftentimes these graves are in remote areas and she'd be exposing herself to tremendous danger by going by herself. So that is not recommended. Once you get there, the first thing you do is you greet the deceased. So you would say, Assalamu alaykum dar qawmin mu'mineen wa muslimin. Or Assalamu alaykum ahl al-diyar min al-mu'mineen wa al-muslimin. Salam means, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the greeting of the prophets, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep you safe and secure from any harm that may befall you. That's what the word salam means. Mu'mineen wa muslimin, believers and Muslims. Believers are higher in rank than Muslims. And we all know that from, you know, from the Qur'an, we'll establish in the Qur'an. Antum as you are the predecessors. Wa inna insha'Allah bikum lalahiqoon. And indeed we, insha'Allah, shall follow you. نسأل الله لنا ولكم العافية. We ask Allah subhanahu wa taala for us and for you. العافية means safety from every harm, every calamity that may be for us. So now this is supplication that you're making for the deceased, right? They hear you. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that they hear us, and he spoke to some of the disbelievers who were killed in the battles, and the Sahaba stood there, you know, astonished. They said, "O Prophet of Allah." The dead, can they hear you? They said, by Allah, you are not able to hear me more than they can. They simply cannot respond. Why? Because there's a barrier between us. They're in a different world, and that's their bodies. But they can hear me. But they cannot respond. So, so the deceased will hear us. And in fact, in fact after you know, the, the uh, burial has, you know, has gone, in the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ tells us that they would hear the sound of the feet. The sound, of the, the sound of the feet of those who buried them walking away from the grave. They can hear that. So certain things they can hear, I cannot go to more details to tell you exactly how they hear whatever, because these are the matters of al-ghayb. And matters of al-ghayb are limited to what's mentioned in the Qur'an and in the Sunnah without adding any further interpretation. So the fact of the matter is that they can hear us when we Say salam to them when we make supplications for them. And again, to observe the sunnah when you make supplications for them is to put your back towards the grave and your face towards the qibla. So this way you're not, you know, resembling the uh, mushrikeen and the disbelievers and what they used to do in the days of ignorance prior to the coming of the message of Islam. Now, what you ought to do when you're at the grave. The Prophet ﷺ said the wisdom behind this permissibility of visiting the graves, فَإِنَّهَا تُذَكِّرُ الْمَوْتِ فَإِنَّهَا تُذَكِّرُ الْمَوْتِ The wisdom behind it is that it reminds you of death. Not at a superficial level. So you'd go there also, something you need to observe is not to sit on a grave. Not to step on a grave. The Prophet ﷺ in the hadith says, it's better for you, or it's less worse for you, to sit on a lit charcoal that will pierce through your garments, than to sit on a grave, than to sit on a grave. So these are things that we must observe. Not to step on a grave, not to step over a grave, not to sit on a grave, okay? And then you would stand there and ponder and realize that this person, at one point, they've owned a business or they had a job, they had degrees, they had a home, they had a wife or they had a husband, they had children, you know, they had friends, they had relatives, they had all of that. They have their personal items, their watch, their ring, and all of that is now left behind. What they've gone with to the other world is their deeds, and simply with one piece of white garment, and that was it. And then to think about yourself being in that grave, because sooner or later, that's what's going to happen. And to think of the questions that Munkar and Nakir will ask you, and to think of what you have prepared to answer these questions. And it's not, of course, uh, this is not an open book exam, if you will. This is based on what you've done with your deeds, based on your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, based on the purity of the tawheed and the commitment and the confidence you've given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as He's the one who's guided you in this dunya and He's the one, inshaAllah, will hold you, you know, will, will allow you to hold steadfast, you know, in this first stage of the hereafter. So to imagine yourself in that life, to imagine the darkness of the grave. 
right? And to imagine how often you invoke peace and blessings upon the Prophet Because the Prophet says, increase invoking peace and blessings upon me because it lights a new grave for you when you go six foot under. Okay? So it allows you, it helps you prepare yourself. And also in another hadith, the Prophet says, أَكْفِرُ مِنْ ذِكْرِ هَادِمِ الْلَدَّاتِ أَوْ هَازِمِ الْلَدَّاتِ You know, often time, you know, remember every single day, if you can, every single day, any moment you can. Hazim al that is death, meaning that the defeater of whims and desires. Hadim al that is the destroyer of the whims and desires. So both of them, you know, complement one another in terms of the meaning, and they reinforce each other's meaning. So this is the wisdom, is that I imagine myself now, I am the one who is down there. What would I like to have done before landing six foot under? So this will allow me to go back and renew my commitment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rejuvenate my deeds, perhaps relearn my salah, increase my righteous deeds, especially if I feel like I'm approaching the finish line. Obviously one who's 10 years old has more hopes in life than one who's 20, or one who's 50, or one who's 70. And in the hadith the Prophet says, ummati ma bayna sittina wa sab'een. The ages of my ummah, and that's the majority, of course, the Prophet is speaking about the majority of the ummah, between 60 and 70. So measure yourself, where do you fall here? Are you 50? Are you 60? Are you 70? If you're 75 and 80, you live in overtime, <laughs> pretty much. If you're 75 and 80, you really live in overtime, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has extended in your life. And as you approach the finish line, your ibadah ought to be more intense. Of course, la yukallifu Allah nafsan illa wa you know, your commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ought to be stronger. Your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ought to be stronger. Your hopes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ought to be more. Because most of the time has gone. So what's left now? What's left is to repent, is to seize any wrongdoing that you've done, to, to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to leave this dunya behind. The days of careers, and having a spouse, and having children, and whatever, all of that is behind us. Like they say, been there, done that. Been there, done that. So now, what's yet to happen is face up the finish line. Okay? Come to the masjid as frequently as you can. Stay in the masjid as much as you can. Read the Quran as much as you can. Fast as much as you can. Look at the Sahabi, uh, the Khalifa, Uthman, Allah. Look at the final days of his life. He was a man who would basically spend his entire day doing nothing but reading the Quran. Reciting the Quran. Of course, I wouldn't advise that to somebody who has children and a spouse and financial obligations and people who are dependent on the no. No, that is not. I'm talking about now the finish line when one approaches the final stages of their lives. Meaning that the children are grown up and gone. Right? The days of uh, pursuing a new career, a new business opportunity, a new career, you know, a new professional uh, you know, interest or whatever, these days are like almost gone. So now I'm just preparing myself you know, to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the best thing we can do, of course, as we mentioned in the final moments, is to think well of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we lead our lives from the beginning, we balance between hope and fear. We stay balanced between hope and fear. But as we approach the finish line, we lean more towards hope than fear. Because the days of doing are almost gone. So now, just basically, you know, renewing our commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thinking well of Him, repenting to Him, and hope to meet Him on favorable terms. Hada Allah ta'ala, a'la wa a'lam, subhanaka wa bihamdik, nashiru an la ilaha illa an. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk, subhana rabbika, rabbil izzati amma yasifun, wa salamun ala al-mursaleen, wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakum wa khairan, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.